All right, welcome back. It is 5 December, and we're just going to keep kicking these out every day, I guess. I've got a lot to go through, and I'm just doing just barely a few lines a day on my timeline. And I've got, what, uh, 211 pages of this. <laughs> so, and I'm constantly adding witness statements and documents so it's probably going to be like closer to 500 when I, by the time I finish but anyway so I just wanted to finish off this may take a couple more days um, on these witness statements about the paper bag in the corner window on the sixth floor and maybe a little bit more about the um, the fingerprints and the rifle because uh, essentially that's the you know that's the Warren Commission's case without those things without those assumptions unchallenged they have no case it's just you know he was a communist and the president drove by his window and it, they have no case because they have uh, we've gonna go over besides this damning test you know damning lack of evidence we're going to go over a witness testimony clearly stating that Oswald was in the second floor lunch room, not on the sixth floor. Pretty damning. But again, what's glaring about the Warren Committee testimony or evidence is the lack of evidence. Because like I said, don't you think... If they had Oswald's fingerprint on the trigger, on the telescope, on the rifle, on the bullets, they would have used it? You're damn right they would have. Just like I said yesterday, it's going to be Mr. and Mrs. Juror. This is Oswald's thumbprint on the, the cartridge as he pushes it into the clip. This is his left thumbprint and his right index finger, you know fingerprint on the on the clip holding it while he's putting the, the rounds in. This is the Oswald's fingerprint on the telescopic scope that he used to sight in and kill the president. This is Oswald's fingerprint, you know, and thumbprint on the stock of the rifle, on the bag that he used to carry the the rifle in to assassinate the president. Don't you think that if they had found that information, they would have used it. Because, you know, Dallas, we're going to see here that Dallas Police Department may be inexperienced and in up, but it all was sent to the FBI within, what, a couple of days. Once they killed Oswald, they had to control the evidence. And that's exactly what they did. They sent it all to the FBI. But as desperate as the FBI was, don't you think if the FBI had found Oswald's fingerprints with the best crime forensics lab in the entire world, okay, don't you think they would have used it? Don't you think that they would have done a paraffin test on Oswald when he was dead, on his face, on his hands? to see if he had, you know, nitrates that shot out of that rifle when that gun fired and that bullet exploded, you know, the cap exploded there. There would have been paraffin all over his cheek and his face, in his hair. Not paraffin, nitrate, excuse me. Don't you think the damn FBI would have found that shit? Think about it. You got to think about these things logically. The glaring evidence that Oswald didn't commit this crime is the lack of evidence showing that he did commit the crime. No fingerprints on the weapon. They got a palm print after he's dead. Dallas police didn't find a palm print, but then the FBI found it after they went to the funeral home and fingerprinted Oswald while he was laying on a slab waiting to be buried the next day. Anyway, we're going to keep going into this and 
just destroy what's left of the Warren Commission's case. Because basically, if you even take this to a grand jury, I doubt even a grand jury would indict Oswald. What? There's no... There's nothing linking Oswald to that firing that gun. Okay? In that window. Nothing. And the Warren Commission, like I said, they've got a whole courtroom to themselves with a captive jury, you, the American people, a judge that doesn't interrupt them, no defense lawyer for Oswald to make objections or to, you know, rebut any of the ridiculous statements that they make to the jury, which is what the Warren Commission report is, is just the evidence they're throwing out there hoping that the, by the preponderance of evidence and in their summation that no one's going to take the time to read through the evidence because it's just too much. I mean, all the shit they got in there. So, it's that old saying, you know, if you can't win them over with substance, bullshit them with bullshit. You know, win them over with bullshit. Okay? That's what we have here. Anyways, let's get into it. So, Detective Marvin Johnson found the paper sack in the sniper corner, but never had it photographed. Matter of fact, he touched it before the photographer got there. So, we'll read his statement real quick. Uh, we've got a couple of different things here. He's got an affidavit and then a statement. So, hold on. Now, this is an interesting statement. So, it says here, I don't know why he's out there measuring like eight days later after the case has been handed over to the FBI, but he went from Market Hall, I guess that's the trademark, um, to Parkland and measured the distance as one mile. Then he went from Parkland to the front door of the Texas School Book Depository, so he kind of did it in reverse, 3.9 miles. And then he says at 2.05, I walked from the Texas School Book Depository building on Elm and Houston to Elm and Murphy Streets at a distance of seven blocks, um, which is done at a fairly fast pace, it took five minutes, 10 seconds. I don't know why he would do this, because this is like a block or two from the police station. Then he walked to the north side of Elm, where the Greyhound bus station was at Lamar and Commerce. And he measured those distances. I don't know why we do all that. But anyway, so we'll get into his testimony here. Let me see here. Hold on one second. All right. So this is his testimony that was taken in April of 1964. And um, of course they do their standard thing where they ask him their name, ask him their address, what's their profession, where'd they go to high school, who was your grandmother, what's your grandmother's name, what's your dog's name, did you serve in the military, did you kill anybody, all these kind of stupid things, you know. And... Um, I guess he was in the military, discharged in 46. He was in the, terror, uh, the dairy business, joined the police department, 1953. He's 43 years old. So this is not a young guy. This is not an inexperienced guy. But even at 43, he picks up the damn paper bag off the floor before they can snap a picture of it to prove that's where they found it. Anyway, so he, around, let's see, he got to the uh, depository around 1 o'clock, so this is 30 minutes after the assassination, went up to the 6th floor, found Captain Fritz, Captain Fritz told him to stand over in the sniper's nest and guard that area. I believe that's, if I remember reading that right. He saw the three halls. Okay, and let's see, what else does he say here? Then he talks about the other people coming. Uh, 
um, up and standing with him and looking at the area. He's looking at the holes. They found a bottle, a pop bottle, and a lunch sack. A brown paper bag with fried chicken and a pop bottle. We went over that earlier. Remnants of uh, fried chicken. There was also, and so like I was saying, the um, the pop bottle and the chicken sack were found at the third window from the, excuse me, the second window, excuse me, the third window from the sniper's nest, okay? So let's take a look at that. Hold on one second. All right, so we're back. So this would be the first window, second window, and then the third window would be on another set of boxes over there. Um, this is the sniper's nest. Right here is where they found the uh, paper that we've been going over that contained the rifle they said and then the holes were found in, he, in this area um, again they take all these pictures they take pictures of the holes but they don't take any pictures of the paper that's found right there so very very interesting I think also to note they they took pictures of the uh, Dr. Pepper bottle and the lunch sack but didn't take pictures of the most important thing the paper sack that supposedly contained the rifle at, at the sniper's nuts there very strange so this is interesting he goes Mr. Bellin says alright now uh, a rifle was found on the sixth floor was it not yes sir when the rifle was found did you leave your post no sir what about detective Montgomery no sir did you find anything else up in the southeast corner of the sixth floor? The southeast corner would be like down here. That would be the sniper's nest. Uh, we have talked about the rifle. We have talked about the shells. We have talked about the chicken bones and the lunch sack and the pop bottle by the second pair of windows. Anything else? Yes, sir. We found this brown paper sack or case. It was made out of a heavy wrapping paper. Actually, it looks similar to the paper that those books were wrapped in. It was just a long, narrow paper bag. Where was this found? Right in the corner of the building. On what floor? The sixth floor. Which corner? Southeast corner. Do you know who found it? I know that the first I saw of it, L.D. Montgomery, my partner, picked it up off the floor. And it was folded. And he unfolded it before the photographer gets there and takes any pictures. So he's not tampering with evidence he's messing with the evidence and also unfolding it putting his fingerprints on it good lord when it was folded up was it folded once or refolded it was folded and then refolded it was a small a fairly small package now do you know where this sack was in relation to the first window counting from the east portion of the south side building it would still be over the went towards the east of the windows it would be east of the windows yes right in the corner of course those windows are not too far from the east wall but the sack was right in the corner so here's an officer saying yeah yeah we, we found OJ socks um, on the floor by his bed but I picked them up we didn't uh, before the photographer got a chance to get in there and take the pictures to locate them so yeah, we found OJ's bloody socks uh, with Nicole Simpson's blood on it. But the photographer, I, I picked him up before the photographer got there. You, you know what would happen to those socks? Boom, thrown out. A judge would throw that shit out. And if a judge didn't throw it out, that portion would get thrown out in appeal. So you got the sack that's part of the of the Warren Commission's case that Oswald brought the rifle in, okay, supposedly, but there's no picture of it in the corner. It's just some policeman saying it was there, and then the policeman did say that he picked it up. 
he tampered with the evidence and contaminated it. Wow. There are some pipes that appear to be in the picture. Is that correct? Some vertical pipes? Yes, sir. Where would the sack have been found with reference to those vertical pipes? And see now, you wouldn't have, Mr. Bellin wouldn't have to be asking this question because he would have the photo and he'd say, is that how you found the sack by the vertical pipes? Yes, sir. I believe on one side of the sixth floor near the eastern corner. That sack would be over near the, near the corner of the building here, pointing. So what he's talking about is right here. If they hadn't have picked it up, that sack prob probably was there. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt, but, you know, <laughs> we're talking about the power of the state to say whatever it wants to say and not have anyone rebut it, not have anyone protest it, you know, they can just say whatever they want. Yeah, we found uh, hair fibers of Oswald, you know, on the boxes, you know. We found a wallet of his in the corner. Oh, I don't have a picture of it, but my partner said he saw the wallet too. You know what happened to that? Thrown out. Anyway, we'll keep going. And then this is even more interesting. Look, he said, your testimony then is that all the sack would have been at the East Pipes. Is that correct? I would say the sack was folded up here and it was east of the pipes in the corner, to my best of my memory. That is where my partner picked it up. I was standing uh, when he picked it up. So his partner, he saw his partner pick it up. You were standing when he picked it up? Yes, because the crime lab was already finished where I was. And I had already walked off to where he was. Now, there's a book carton located, one standing by itself in the picture. It would be northeast of these pipes, is that correct? See, this is why they have to keep going over exactly the location, because they didn't have a fucking picture of it. They picked it up before the, the crime lab got there and took a picture of it. Pretty crappy. But you're just supposed to ignore that and accept that's what the state, you know, no evidence, but let's just say that's just what the state is saying. You know, the Warren Commission, the prosecution... Whatever it would be, oh, just trust us, it was there, you know, just like, you know, if you got some guy who's on trial for having drugs in his, um, I don't know, his nightstand, okay, the police open up the nightstand, they find the drugs, they pick them up, take them outside, test them, yeah, they're drugs, but they don't take a picture when they found the drugs, you know, it could be the difference between getting that thrown out and going to jail for 15, 20 years. If it's a couple of kilos of drugs. But we're just supposed to accept whatever the prosecution says, whatever the detectives say, whatever the state says, with no evidence to, to prove what they just said. Okay? And if you don't think that policemen cover each other's ass wow you, you're pretty damn naive okay they know they screwed up that's why the other ones that they're oh yeah he saw it I saw it we all saw it he picked it up I saw it we all saw it, it was there that's why Mr. Bellin's having to go over the exact location because if they had a fucking picture they wouldn't need to go over the exact location And then listen to this. All right. What is the fact as to whether or not the pinned rectangle on RLS deposit deposition exhibit G does any portion of that rectangle represent the place where the paper bag was found, assuming that is the southeast corner? So, I don't have a picture of that, but... They were so desperate to prove that the sack was there that they even, somebody went along from the Warren Commission and drew like dotted lines to show the outline of a long sack. But it's too long, okay? 
Because then Mr. Johnson said, it looks like somebody pinned that in to show the sack was lying there. That would show it unfolded. Remember, he, he said it was folded. Okay. So now they have to manufacture evidence by, by drawing in an unfolded one, which is not the way it was found. Wow. I know this may seem mundane, but this is the Warren Commission's case. They saw Oswald, you know, Frazier saw Oswald bring in the package. It was under his arm. Okay. It was way too long to be the package for the rifle. Now they're going to say, oh, well, that same ri uh, package that was way too short to be the rifle is the same package that they found in the corner by the sniper's nest where they were firing, where Oswald was firing the rifle. But we don't have a picture of of the bag there okay and then the one that we do have looks completely different than the police one that was brought out and photographed by the news media okay and then it, oh and by the way just ignore that we don't have any fingerprints on the rifle of Oswald anywhere just a palm print not found by the detectives in Dallas but found by the FBI after Oswald was dead. Pretty crappy. Very, very crappy. Again, we're supposed to just accept what the state says and not challenge it. They don't have anybody in, you know, if they were in court, like I said, they don't have anybody objecting, challenging, asking to be thrown out because there's no evidence of it. It's just totally insane. This is why Oswald could not make it out of the police garage alive. If Oswald had gone to trial, the case maybe would have been thrown out even before trial, but when he got there, most likely would have been found innocent. Because any two bit lawyer, you know, better call Saul a lawyer, I guess, could go in and just say, look, jury, Mr. Jury. Mrs. Juror, there's no fucking evidence that Oswald had that rifle and was firing that rifle. He didn't have any nitrate gunpowder on his face, which he would have gotten if he had been firing a rifle. He had his cheek right up to the scope. That nitrate would have blasted out of that chamber up into his face, into his skin. It's probably, there's still probably nitrates on Oswald's skin, even as he's being buried and put in the ground. There's no fingerprints of Oswald anywhere on the gun. Virtually impossible. Like I said, you've got to take that clip and hold it, unless he puts it in a mount, and then takes gloves and holds the bullets, and pushes those with his thumb down into the clip. You've got to push five bullets with your thumb down into that metal clip. And then you got to take that clip and push it down into the magazine holder there and then you gotta grab that bolt and pull it back and eject one cartridge that you just fired and push that bolt forward and lock it and then fire again and you're not leaving any fingerprints anywhere no fingerprint on the trigger no fingerprint on the the handle for the bolt no thumb or fingerprint as you're holding the stock and firing down the street it's impossible. No fingerprint on the paper bag that you supposedly brought the rifle to that assassination window. That's their case. Okay? And it's all bullshit. But again, they've got a courtroom with a captive jury, hardly a judge, and no defense team to rebut anything or to object to anything. That's why, you know, they put out, what, 16 volumes of a fucking Warren report? Because they knew, you know, 150 million people weren't going to read through 16 volumes of a goddamn Warren report. Thousands of pages. They would get lost in the mundane. But if you break it down to its simplest, Oswald's prints weren't on the rifle. He couldn't have fired the rifle. There's testimony he was in the second floor lunchroom 
at the time of the assassination. Case closed. Dismissed. That's why they had to shoot Oswald in the police basement. He could not get away and get to trial. Okay? They charged him and they executed him. They didn't take him to trial because if he'd gone to trial, he would have walked and he would have talked. He would have talked long before he walked. Oh, I got a story for you. I was working with this person, with that person. They had to kill him. That's exactly what they did. They weren't fucking around. All right, so that's enough of Mr. Johnson. So we'll go into the next one here. All right, so this is Johnson's detective buddy on the sixth floor, Detective L.D. Montgomery. Okay, and Mr. Griffin is interviewing him, so we'll see what they have to say. One thing before we get into the meat of his testimony, I love how they do this like it's a court case. Okay, like Oswald's sitting over there as a defendant with his lawyer, and they're sitting there, you know, asking questions to a witness in the witness stand, which is what they do, but there's no judge. Okay, there's no jury in, in the jury box. There's no Oswald sitting over there in his suit listening to the testimony. And he didn't have a lawyer. It's all you have is the witness on the witness stand. No judge. You've got the commission who's driving all the testimony in one direction. That Oswald did it and he did it alone. There was no... Russians, no mafia, nobody else involved. Okay? Because Johnson, President Johnson went to Chief Justice Warren and said, if we know others were involved, but if it comes back, it could lead back to the Cubans and the Russians, and that would start World War III. And you, Justice Warren, don't want to be responsible for a nuclear war that kills 50 million Americans, do you? Okay? So it stops and it, you know, it, it, it starts and it stops at Oswald. Case closed. Boom. Go do your business. And that's what they did. But I love how they make, they try to make it all legal and how it looks official. You know, they tell him, you know, would you like a lawyer? You want to waive your rights? Okay. I don't know why I would need a lawyer. You know, famous last words of the convicted. Oh, I don't need a lawyer. I'm innocent. I'll tell you anything. Never talk to a fucking cop. Never talk to a prosecutor without a lawyer. Okay? You get, if, how many people have we seen in America that spent 20, 30 years in prison because they didn't have a fucking lawyer and got convicted and they didn't commit the crime? How many? Hundreds. Okay? Especially in Dallas. They're so notorious. Of, uh, you know, you're going to get the death penalty unless you fess up, you know, scaring them to death. And then people confess to something they didn't commit. Anyway, so they go into it like it's all official and everything. And, you know, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're going to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. And they may even have him raise his right hand. Well, Mr. Montgomery, Mr. Warren, are you raising your right hand to tell the truth and, you know, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? No. So how can you expect a witness to tell the truth if you're not even going to tell the truth? Anyway, all right, so we'll get into this god-awful, ridiculous crap. It just makes... The more I, more evidence I read about this shit, the more disgusted I get. Because, you know, we go around the world as Americans telling everybody how great America is and how just America is and how we're this great democracy, yet we murdered our own president 60 years ago and then lied to cover it up and killed people to cover it up. Just disgusting. Anyway, all right, we'll keep getting into it, and I'm going to just destroy these guys, okay? <clears throat> because
because once you get into all this evidence they don't stand a chance in court they don't stand a chance anywhere I'm not even a lawyer but I can tell you that any lawyer half its fucking wit better call Saul lawyer could destroy the government's case if given enough chance anyway all right we'll go down and see what we have here uh, this is interesting so Montgomery was there in the basement when Oswald was shot I didn't even get down this far but it's kind of interesting um, he changed his clothes let's see if, see what else we have here all right this is interesting I actually jumped ahead here but we'll go ahead and read this so he's saying they're bringing Oswald down I don't say he open then Captain Fritz goes over and opens the car door and there was a lot of noise and then I heard the shot okay and then he made his way around um, Officer Graves to the left and grabbed uh, Ruby by the throat okay and got him down on the concrete and then they dragged him in put him on the floor inside the room and Ruby hollered and said you all know me I'm Jack Ruby Wow yeah I guess the, he knew everybody and they all knew him Wow Detective Graves says I've got the pistol right here and pulled it out of his pocket and showed it to me So this is interesting. So he had heard rumors from other police officers, and he surmised that Ruby just walked down uh, there as one of the officers was backing the car out up the ramp. There was a car going down there, and they had to back out the main street ramp. As they were backing out, the officers that were lined up there on the ramp, indicating security, were assisting the car out, and so then, therefore, they missed Ruby as Ruby walked down the ramp. Yeah. Very interesting. So this is interesting. Montgomery knows Ruby, um, but Captain Fritz doesn't know him. Okay? And so as we were going out to Parkland, Captain Fritz was saying, kept saying, Who's Jack Ruby? And I told him, He is the man that runs the Club Vegas out on Oak Lawn asked me did I know him I said yes I used to have a district uh, for about four years there interesting all right so we're finished with that so basically he knew Ruby uh, just not very well is what he's trying to say I'm sure uh, this is about R.L. Studebaker he is like the forensic guy does the dusting also takes the pictures things like that wasn't very experienced had no formal training in it at all and that's the camera he was using um, he didn't arrive until 1 15 so 45 minutes after the assassination finally the forensic guy gets there he only had two months of on-the-job crime scene photographing experience Wow pretty crappy so he took pictures of the three halls didn't take a picture of the um, the paper sack took a picture of the gun behind the boxes dusted several boxes for fingerprints Looks like he found a partial print on it. Found a palm print on the box. Now, again, if any of these had contained Oswald's fingerprints or palm prints, don't you think that the Warren Commission would have mentioned that? But they don't.
See, there's the corner, no bag. There's the corner, and see, they had to draw where the bag had been, but they drew it extended out. I mean, how can you have an exhibit of evidence and the piece of evidence isn't there? There's the Coke bottle or the Dr. Pepper bottle in the sack. Here's another Dr. Pepper bottle. Crazy. Anyway, this is Robert Robert Lee Studebaker. He's the forensics person. Now, when he mentions dusting powder, let me go over again that your fingers and your skin actually, but especially your fingers, secrete an oil, okay? Whenever you put your fingers on something, it leaves, you know, that oil stuck to whatever the material you, you, you grab there. If it's a flat surface like metal, you know, plastic or something, it's going to have a better, um, you know, outline of your fingerprint. Okay, they use the powder to highlight the print and then they use the tape to pull the print off and then the cardboard card, they take the tape and put it onto the cardboard card to keep the print. That's one way of lifting prints. It's not like when you go in and get ink on your fingers and they put it on a card, it's not exactly the same. It's kind of like a negative reverse of that. All right. So he got the call at 105. He was down there by 115, but still 45 minutes after the assassination. All right. So they also use ultraviolet light to spot the prints. And they use this black volcano powder, okay, which gets it sticks to the uh, oil on the prints. And then you can take those off with the tape and put that back on to the uh, print card. All right, now this is very interesting. So by lifting print, you mean it stands out. Raising the print up, raising the invisible print, which is a latent print. And latent means you can't visibly see it usually. It will raise the moisture out of the paper um, that it is pressed on. So the paper bag, the paper on the uh, boxes. It takes about seven pounds of pressure to leave a latent fingerprint. And the moisture in your fingers, in the pores of your skin, is what leaves the print on the paper. But it's invisible until you put your powder on there, and then it raises it. So he's explaining the process of how the fingerprints are left. And then he says here, they found empty holes in the southeast corner. They found three empty holes, and we went over there and took photographs of that. See, this is what a detective does. Okay, so you've got Johnson and uh, Montgomery. They're detectives. They show up. They secure the scene. They make sure that no one gets into that crime scene until the forensics guys get there you know, dust for prints, take photographs, things like that, and they take it back and analyze it and test it. And then the detective using that information, you know, goes out on interviews, things like that. All right, he says we took double shots of each one, I would hope, of the halls. And let's take a look at that photograph. Yeah, so you see one of the holes there. The photograph's kind of bad, but there's two other ones here. And then we've got what is this one? Yeah, and then you can see the hole there. See, this is the sniper's nest. 
when you pull back the bolt it ejects the shell it flips it it lands to the right okay and then you push that cartridge back in boom I'm um, excuse me you push that bolt back in and it loads another bullet ready to be fired and so it says here that's right uh, that yes sir that's why right after these were taken they said they had found a rifle about 122 he got there 115 they found it at 122 and to bring the cameras over to the northwest corner of the building where the rifle was found and I loaded everything up and carried it over there did you take a picture of that yes sir on this day on the on these lieutenant day also took pictures he also took pictures of his gun of this gun we took two shots apiece All right, and then here is a picture. Of the weapon. Somewhere in there is the weapon. I don't see it. Clearly, let's see here. I don't do you see a weapon in that picture? I know there is a picture of the weapon, but I don't see the picture I don't see the, maybe that's the weapon oh, okay there it is okay I see it now see there's the barrel there's the stock all right and this is interesting so this is a picture taken during while the shots are being fired you can see the two workers here on the fifth floor they're right below the sniper's window it's set up there if you could I don't know can we zoom in on that let's take a look here do we see Oswald in this window let's take a look there's a figure right there but I can't tell if it's Oswald or not But it's obviously someone is there. I don't see how anyone could see anyone in that window, though. With their bald head or wearing a sports coat or holding a rifle. That's barely, what, 12 inches right there. Maybe 18 inches at the most. Alright, so let's see here. What else do we have? Anything? Not, like I said, I'm not going to read the whole damn thing because it's very boring. I'm just going to hit the highlights. Again, here's the the picture here. This is the approximate location of the wrapping paper. You see? They don't even have the wrapping paper there. and it's, It would have been half of this because he said it was folded. Or double folded, excuse me. All right, keep going here. Yeah, he says, where you have the dotted lines, that's where he drew that. But see, here's the thing, is that he's drawing, okay, this piece of paper was picked up by the de other detective, Montgomery Johnson, excuse me. And the uh, Bru Studebaker is drawing this on the photograph afterwards, saying that's where it approximately it was that he saw it. But if he had saw it there, he would have taken a picture of it. Okay, he's going by the description they told him. If he saw it there, he would have had a picture of it. Right? It would be in this picture. 
So, he's not really lying, but he's stretching the truth. He said it was doubled. It was a piece of paper about this long, and it was doubled over. I don't know how long it was. He said he didn't, and he doesn't even measure the paper. I mean, come on. <laughs> that's their case, folks. Case over. You got a forensic guy that's not taking. He's describing what he saw, supposedly not taking a picture of it, drawing in a little diagram of what the paper was, but not taking a picture of it. Okay, and didn't measure it. Crazy. All right, so he says, I dusted everything around there. There were smears and smudges on boxes. Did you dust the rifle? No, sir. Lieutenant Day handled the rifle part of it. I didn't mess with the rifle at all. He took it down to City Hall and worked on it down there at the lab. So we're going to read Lieutenant Day after we finish this guy. We may not get all into it, though. Let's see. What else is he doing? Is there anything that I'm missing here? Now, how big was the paper that you saw? You saw the wrapper. Tell me about how big that paper was. How long was it? It was about, I would say, three and a half to four feet long. About? They didn't measure it? And how wide would you say it would be? Eight inches. Wow. All right, so that's enough of the incredibly inept Studebaker we're going to read um, what J.C. Day says about the gun here hold on one second alright so this is his affidavit of J.C. Day done on May 7th 1964 alright I stated I did not remember who returned the two spent 6.5 holes envelope to my possession on that night since returning to Dallas, turning to Dallas Detective C.N. Doherty has called my attention to the fact that he brought the three holes in the envelope to me and asked me to check them again for fingerprints even though I checked them when they were picked up on the sixth floor of the school book depository about 120 by detective rm sims and myself placed in a manila envelope since talking to already i remember now that it was one that he was the one who returned the shells to me about 10 p.m and stated that his office wanted to retain one he left me two shells and the envelope that detective sims and i had previously marked it was then I scratched my name on the two shells that were released at 1145 agent Vince Drain along with the rifle and other evidence. All right, so this one, and he did another affidavit on the 23rd of June 1964. This following affidavit is to make to clear up confusion uh, regarding the three spent 6.5 hauls. Uh, commission numbers 543, 544, and 545. Now, where's the the fourth bullet that wasn't fired that was found in the rifle? Hmm. No, no mention here. The holes were picked up by Detective R.M. Sims and Lieutenant J.C. Day and placed in an envelope 
Detective R.L. Studebaker was also present. The envelope was marked and dated uh, by Sims and Day. Detective Sims took the holes after they were checked for fingerprints by Day. Um, the third hole, commission number 545, was later released directly to the FBI by the Dallas Police Department Homicide Division at 10 uh, p.m., November 22nd, Detective C. N. Doherty brought the three holes in the marked envelope back to Lieutenant Day in the Identification Bureau to recheck for prints. Doherty uh, retained one hole, Commission Number 545, and left the other two, Commissions Number 543 and 544, along with the envelope with me uh, sent to the FBI. Vince Drain, FBI agent, took custody at 1145 the same day. When I appeared before the commission on April 22, 1964, I could not find my name on one of the halls identified as the commission number 543 and thought this was the hall that had been retained by Doherty. On June 8, 1964, the three halls commissions number 543, 544, 545 were back in Dallas and were examined by Captain G.M. Doherty and myself at the local FBI office. Interesting. Close examination by a magnifying glass uh, under a good light disclosed uh, my name, Day, was on all three hulls at the small end. Also, GD uh, for Captain George Dowdy was on two of them. Commission numbers 543 and 544 were first sent to Washington on November 22nd, 1963. They have Doherty's initials where he marked the halls as they were released to Vince Drain at 11.45 p.m. on November 22, 1963 by Doherty and Day. The third hole, Commission Number 545, does not have Doherty's mark, but is plainly marked Day. Uh, in Washington, I had numbers 543 and 545 switched because I didn't find my name on number 543. I can identify commission number 543544 and 545 from my name on them as three holes found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository on November 22nd, 1963. As to the time I scratched my name on the holes, I do not remember whether it was at the window when picked up at 10 p.m. November 22nd, 1963 when they were returned to me by Doherty in the marked envelope. I had to be one or the other because this is the only time I had all three holes in my possession. Both Detective R.L. Studebaker and Detective R.M. Sims were present at the window when the holes were picked up and stated I marked them as they were found under the window. That's confusing because <laughs> he's saying here that he marked them at the window in the th school books depository, but he's saying up here that he marked them after he picked them up. I'm confused. Anyway, so we'll go into his longer statement here. Does he do anything with the rifle at all? All right, let's see what we have here. So he didn't get to Houston and Elm until 112, almost 40 two minutes after the assassination. Ah, here we go, and here's the meat of it. It says, Mr. Day, uh, we're taking a process these three holes for fingerprints using a powder. Mr. Sims picked them up by the ends and handed them over to me. I processed each of the three, did not find fingerprints. As I had finished that, Captain French sent word to me to come to the northwest part of the building the rifle had been found and he wanted photographs. So then he says here, he says, at the time, the three holes were placed in the envelope and the envelope marked. The three holes were not marked at that time. Mr. Sims took possession of them. But in his prior affidavit, right here, he says, both Detective R.L. Studebaker and Detective R.M. Sims, who were present at the window when the holes were picked up, stated, I marked them as they were found under the window. 
maybe he meant that he marked him on the floor. I'm not, I'm confused a little bit. And it says here, could you tell us exactly what you did to, in testing those holes for fingerprints? I used fingerprint powder dusted on them with the powder, dark powder. No legible prints were found. Again, think about it. These bullets are going to come in a package, okay? And Oswald's going to have to tear that package open. He's going to have to use his thumb and his index finger to pick up one bullet and then he's gonna have to use you know maybe his right hand and then his left hand he's gonna have to have his thumb and his finger to hold that clip then he's gonna have to take that bullet and push it down into the clip with his thumb but no fingerprints were found not even a partial on the rounds doesn't make much sense. So he's saying there that he dusted for prints and found two partial prints. And we're almost done with this part here. Okay. To my secretary, she wrote on the typewriter, 4x8 coded, Ordnance Optics Incorporated, Hollywood, California, 010 Japan, OSC inside a clover leaf design. What did that reference to? That was stamped on the sculptic sight on the top of the gun. On the gun itself, 6.5 caliber C2766-1940 made in Italy. That was what was on the gun. I dictated certain other stuff, other information for her to type for me. When the bolt was open, one live round was in the barrel. No prints were on the live round. Captain Prince and Lieutenant Day opened the barrel. Captain Prince has the live rounds. Three spent holes were found under the window. They were picked up by Detective Sims and witnessed by Lieutenant Day and Studebaker. The clip is stamped SMI 9 by two inches all right I took it to the office tried to bring out the two prints I had seen on the side of the gun at the bookstore um, they still were rather unclear due to the roughness of the metal I photographed them rather 
then try to lift lift them I could also see a trace of a print on the side of the barrel that extended under the woodstock I started to take the woodstock off and noted traces of the palm print near the firing near the firing end of the barrel about three inches under the woodstock when I took the woodstock loose So he's talking about halfway down the barrel, between the barrel, into the barrel, and the in the stock. All right. We'll continue this tomorrow. And um, let me see here. Yeah, we'll continue this tomorrow because I'm at my hour here. Okay, take care. This is not as exciting and boring, but this is where the facts are. And we're going to keep going down the facts and reading everything and noting everything. And wherever it leads us, we'll end up. All right, take care. Bye.